Okay, very good morning, Wednesday 29th of April. Hope you're doing well. Uh, just a quick final reminder, later on this evening, I will be covering the FOMC in full live via a webinar on Zoom. Uh, you are welcome to register. Uh, whether you're a trader or a student, you can join us. All you need to do is go on the link I'm gonna post in the video description. Uh, I think there's about 100 spaces left. So look forward to talking to you guys later on. Will's also going to join us as well as Piers and the others. We're going to have a bit of a chat about some tips about managing your kind of trading mindset as well. Uh, so a couple of topics around psychology will also be covered. So I'm looking forward to that, that session. Uh, but looking at the, the, the day ahead uh, and what have we got on the agenda. Uh, so this morning, yeah, quite interesting actually. I was, I was watching the, the news when it came out last night for Alphabet, quite keen to see their earnings results. Uh, initially in the aftermarket trade, they were up about 4%. It actually went as high as 9% uh, in extended hours trade. And that pretty much arrested what was a lower close on Wall Street, led by the NASDAQ. Uh, I think the other indices were down uh, more the losses were more marginal kind of like around the half percent region but the Nasdaq was underperforming you can see pretty big sell-off that we had pretty much through the initiation of the the open and then went all the way back down to around 86.50 which respectively was around close to its S2 on the daily pivots um, but you can see a gap up here uh, and then we've pushed up higher during the Asia Pacific session so Hong Kong, Shanghai, Sydney, all their local stock indices rose. Uh, equities in, in South Korea also were higher despite a warning from Samsung Electronics that their profit may fall in the second quarter uh, as the pandemic is obviously hitting demand at the moment. Um, but otherwise, it was you know, a, a much needed event to, to offset some of the selling pressure that was being observed yesterday. Um, but this morning, uh, just coming under a little bit of pressure once again, reversing perhaps some of that move. Uh, there has been it's quite a busy earnings day in general. Not only is there a few things to, to look out for from the US and pre and after market. We've had, I can just see AstraZeneca uh, being out this morning. Their core EPS a touch above expectations at 105. Revenues also actually a beat. Uh, their final 2020 guidance remains unchanged. I know that Deutsch has been out. There's a few other names as well. So do make sure then ahead of the cash open in about half an hour's time that you've had a, uh, a good read through if you're trading any of those indices. Um, but in other markets, uh, T-notes, a little bit of an uptick amid just some of this latest, um, just fade if you like, of the gains that were seen overnight uh, in the equity space. So the US 10 year bottom right here, just coming close proximity to the uh, late US session highs that we printed yesterday at 139.03 and a half so just keeping an eye on that some near-term resistance for this morning um, gold pretty unreactive to all of this at the moment so far this morning um, trading just above its pivot at 1724 in the futures uh, and oil uh, having dipped considerably yesterday finding a bit of a flaw around the psychological ten dollar handle uh, just given again the kind of liquidation of the USO into further out uh, duration kind of contracts in the calendar months looking to offset any repeat of what we had last week with that uh, kind of negative oil price situation with that front month futures contract uh, and so prices have bounced a decent amount uh, we're up about just over three dollars from those lows uh, and probably now that a lot of that has happened to a certain degree they've spread that across several months now probably the the likelihood lessens a little bit that we're going to get this massive run on markets can't imagine there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be one of touching that that june contract in particular uh, but obviously it does remain susceptible on the downside for to potentially quite violent movements as people kind of liquidate the the positions in that specific contract roll over to say july and so on um, but for the moment fairly stable um, finding a bit of a platform at a level you can see here down the bottom chart of what was providing some resistance yesterday evening and also during the um, I should say Monday evening and also yesterday in the afternoon session uh, and that was also an area of support as well on 23rd in that June contract so uh, just sitting at around that technical point at the moment uh, there were the API numbers they were out last night uh, while I'm on the subject what did they look like well we had a crude build of 9.978 million uh, slightly smaller actually than what markets were anticipating we've obviously obviously seen some huge 
consecutive builds. This is the 14th, in fact, weekly crude build. Um, and the gasoline surprise, though, with the drawdown after four weeks of builds. So that gasoline number, in fact, uh, just just going against the, the recent trend. But the crude headline um, markets, you can see, not really that reactive to it. I don't think that's particularly a surprise, as I've said. It's been multiple weeks in a row now we've been seeing these these particularly large bills just given the the pandemic situation um, that's ongoing at the moment hampering demand and therefore still a somewhat oversupplied situation until those cuts really start to take hold from OPEC plus over the coming weeks um, back to the charts momentarily um, elsewhere in the FX markets uh, not really too much going on right now. Uh, dollar just coming back a little bit from having declined overnight in the Asian session. Uh, the Dixie narrowing its losses to just one tenth of a percent. So euro dollar top left and cable beside it, uh, just sitting above the pivot at the moment. Uh, the pivot probably being a fairly decent level in both pairs for the time being. Um, just having a look here, you can see if I just quickly highlight it. This area of highs that we were we were trading back on on Monday session, we had a retest of that same area uh, yesterday evening, uh, and that's where that pivot resides at the moment. Uh, and in, in euro dollar, you've got the overnight Asia Pacific kind of low here. So we'll just make this a bit bigger. Uh, and you've got those other highs as well that we're seeing from yesterday evening, and then going back as well to some of those other areas here and here of interest around that similar price point which again would coincide around the pivot level you know the one thing to be aware of i guess going into today's session is we now start heading into what is the fairly busy part of the calendar um, we've got the fed obviously happening later on this evening we've got the ecb uh, tomorrow you've got lots of earnings coming out you've got people like boeing coming out later uh, i think you've got microsoft aftermarket today um, you've got Apple, Amazon, you know, some of the world's biggest companies reporting over the next two days. So there's quite a lot here that could act as potential, I guess, catalysts to then inspire uh, the next kind of more directional move in markets. So at the moment, I'm kind of going into this morning, I guess, fairly neutral in a sense. Um, I mean, with the S&P 500, I was just looking this morning, there's a fairly nice level of of support more more broadly speaking uh, this is just what i wanted to do here was encapsulate this, this rectangle here which was the s p uh, coming under pressure via the the kind of drag that the oil price shock was creating uh, at the beginning of last week uh, and as we were discussing in the briefing yesterday that kind of time has passed now and equities largely have been ignoring a lot of that negative price movement um, yesterday we saw a breakout of kind of the the range of what we had been trading over the course of the last kind of two weeks quite a powerful initial move on the upside you can see however then as soon as the the market opened on Wall Street we came crashing back down again only then to reverse but there's a couple of nice nice points I guess of support uh, that uh, just gonna zoom this in a touch here so the pivot level, again, just kind of like with those currencies here, uh, looks quite nice just from the, the Monday high top and going back onto the 20th as well. So it's probably going to be a, a decent level now, uh, certainly until we hear a bit more from these earnings reports that are going to be coming out later uh, and then the open on, on Wall Street as well. Um, just having a look, seeing what this trend line potential, a couple of touches there. Uh, and that would coincide, depending on what the time frames are, with around some of that, those highs that were seen uh, in the overnight late Asia Pacific session, early European um, entrance. That comes in around that 2900 level, uh, which is also around that R1. And uh, depending on where that would come in with that trend line, might be worth just keeping an eye on uh, if we come back up to that level uh, later on as part of the session as it develops. Any break below pivot? Uh, then on the, the move to the downside, you've got the, uh, the kind of the weekly low, if you like, down at this level, which I'd probably be keeping an eye on if we were to trade a little bit more heavy around 28.53. So some nice, you know, the S&P has been, uh, I know Sam has been commenting with it to a couple of the guys, uh, quite nice technically over the last week or so. It's been forming these nice kind of periods of consolidation break in either direction 
but typically from the back end of last week breaking higher and then forming this a, a kind of nice structure to then push ahead again on a break and a classic to get back in and long on the pullback um, and so be similar similar kind of uh, techniques we'll be using as we go in the period ahead but as I said going forward w will the market have much appetite I'm not sure obviously there's quite a few things the Fed although I'm not really expecting a great deal out of them um, they haven't really provided any way in the form of real clear guidance since their last meeting post the pandemic and lockdown uh, and so that's going to be probably the most interesting point rather than any new policy shifts in, in that sense because we've already seen them do so much already. Um, all right, a quick run through of some of the headlines. Um, Alphabet, as I mentioned, um, pretty pretty decent. Upbeat executive comment showed the company's cloud and YouTube businesses kept growing uh, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Sales were 33.71 billion, up 14% from a year ago above street estimates. Um, YouTube revenues jumped 33.5 percent. Their Google Cloud top line soared 52 percent, and their shares were up 9 percent in aftermarket trade. Uh, the company's search and display ad revenues, though, had dropped 10 percent in March. Uh, a lot of that coming uh, amid the the kind of the associated lockdowns. A lot of businesses having to tighten their belts, so decreasing their marketing budgets. Uh, and that, that hurting that side of the business. But overall, fairly positive um, and executives op optimistic on usage trends and longer term uh, prospects. Uh, elsewhere, the other thing that I just saw in Bloomberg that I thought uh, I might point out, because often you hear people referring to the VIX, uh, and they were suggesting that the fear gauged basically is closed below its second month future. And I'll explain what that means in a moment, but in summary, it means that the S&P 500 volatility measure a, a bullish sign over the next month. Uh, and what this looks like is, is this. Um, so essentially, the VIX closed below its second month future on Monday for the first time since February. Um, if you look back to where we were here on the 21st of Feb, um, and this, this would reflect going back to a more normal structure. So contracts dated further out uh, tend to carry more uncertainty than those closer in. Uh, so what you should see then is that normal kind of uh, trajectory of a curve in its regular kind of shape, saying you know, the further you go out in the future, the more uncertainty that there is about what might happen. And so therefore, uh, we're seeing a bit of a reversal that would be a signal that actually this pattern would suggest that potentially people are foreseeing a period of calm uh, in the period ahead, whether or not that materializes or not. Uh, obviously, a lot of the things that we've been talking about, what could create the next spark of uh, potential violent price movement, um, I think probably the main risk to that is going to be the potential for a second wave on the back of uh, the relaxation of lockdown measures globally. Uh, but the reality of that is we're probably a couple of weeks away from that even being known, because if you think about it, um, not only are we looking at more like mid to late May for most countries lockdowns really to be loosened more significantly but then there's that incubation period which can be up to two weeks before people even start to so show signs that they've contracted this virus so um, probably makes sense that why this is reflecting in that way uh, but you know, a couple of people looking at this is then um, you know, if you're following that trend in the equity market despite the little sell-off that we had yesterday um, then you know, we could be on for a continuation of that move. And just looking at the S&P on a slightly longer time frame, if we were looking at the, the daily, this is kind of that, that fixed chart I've had for, for a while, and we've managed to get above quite a key area of resistance around that 2855, um, which was the, the October low. And it was also an area which the market found some resistance uh, back in the, the mid part of April, so about two weeks ago. Um, but we've managed to push back above that. We've now got the 618 fib from the all-time high to the March 23rd low coming in not too far above the current price. It's probably the next target to look out for. And then above there, around 29.49.50, which would be those peaks that you can see there uh, that we've printed, which were previous all-time highs, of course, uh, back in October of 2018 and then April of 2019 as well. 
Uh, and you can see the peaks of some of the, the other price action through the period of, of, of 19. So probably up around here will be the next interesting test if we continue to move higher. Uh, you've then got the 200 DMA coming in, which would kind of run into around the 3000 level if you're looking at the S&P uh, in the futures. Okay, other things to be aware of. We've had some Australian data come out overnight. Um, the Aussie touch firmer, uh, nothing spectacular, but is trading above its R1 in, at the moment, up about 37 pips. Uh, this, the Australian CPI makes for quite sensational reading, but I would say it's probably um, more of a temporary uh, lift rather than anything sustainable. Uh, so food underpins stronger inflation, uh, essentially. So if you think about it, they've had wildfire, uh, they've had the bushfires that's caused immense damage. Uh, and so you know, the available number of goods to eat in terms of uh, fruit and veg and so on uh, would have been diminished and therefore prices were higher already. Now you've had the coronavirus shut down impacting food prices given the, the kind of infantry building and things that people were doing, uh, kind of stockpiling and so on. So uh, CPI rise at the fastest pace since 2014. Yes, that's the first time the headline figure back inside the RBA target since 2018. But I don't think I wouldn't really read too much into that um, because ultimately beyond that those those effects generally speaking the Australian economy like everyone else in the globe is going to slow considerably under the pressure uh, of the reality of the, the the pandemic and people's loss of jobs loss of income loss of confidence and so naturally um, inflation will decline under those types of circumstances particularly in the context of more loosening of monetary policy from the RBA. Another headline as well, uh, you had a surprise announcement from Fitch. Uh, they downgraded Italy's rating by one notch to triple B minus. That's just one level above junk for Italy. Um, they weren't actually scheduled to hold their next meeting until July 10th when they had a review date. Uh, Moody's is due next month, uh, but they came out and they made this out of cycle downgrade anyway. Um, quite a few people I saw on Twitter were talking about this. Um, because it was an unexpected announcement. But the one thing I want to remind you is remember the ECB has already um, kind of made that move in buying sovereign and corporate, what they call fallen angels, uh, which means that a credit rating that drops as far as a certain level below investment grade would be aimed, or well, that they can basically still be eligible for collateral with the central bank. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't read too much into this to be honest, and it is still in investment grade. But the point is, it's just one notch away from being junk, which obviously would be quite symbolic in nature. But the overall changes and shifts are already being made by the central banks and and, and namely the ECB. And perhaps this could be something we'll be looking out for in the press conference for sure, uh, in terms of questions that will be put to Christine Lagarde. Uh, interested to see what she has to say when that happens. As far as the Fed is concerned for tonight. Um, as I said, the registration link for our, for our Zoom session is in the, the video, so, so do sign up for that. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail right now. All I'm going to say is really um, we're looking out mainly for forward guidance, as I said earlier. Uh, they've kind of deployed a lot of their weapons or bullets at this point, uh, and what we're more concerned about now is their, how do they currently see uh, current conditions and what's their future expectation. Uh, the current guidance as it stands officially from the Fed was issued before the mass layoffs begun. Uh, and obviously we've got jobless claims coming tomorrow. I think I caught a headline. Uh, we're going to probably see another 3-4 million type number. Uh, and obviously this is getting into the idea then that we're gonna, we could see layoffs in the month of April alone when we get to around to non-farm payrolls next Friday, which could be around the 25 million marker. So you know, it's this type of thing well, you know, what are the Fed not just saying about that situation, but what do they see for the period ahead for the second half of the year it would be particularly interesting uh, to see what options, how confident they are and what options do they have on the table if things were to take another sudden turn uh, for the worse, if we were to see quite a large second wave on the relaxation of these, uh, these lockdown measures. Uh, so that's the type of thing in, in summary I'm looking at. From a Canada point of view, uh, we have got uh, on the docket here, the German state CPIs, they typically start coming out at 8 o'clock. So we'll get Saxony, followed by Brandenburg, baden württemberg and, and so on. Um, then at 10 o'clock, you've got the various sentiment 
indicators coming out of Europe, economic industrial services. I know these are highlighted on the calendar, but they don't really move the market. So I'd kind of discount those. I wouldn't really factor them too much into your, your strategies for this morning. Um, and then going into the afternoon, of course, we get the Q1 advance US GDP. Now, a little bit uh, up for debate about how important is this gonna be. Um, one of the things here, I don't know if you can quite see it, but I'll read it out. The expectation is for a minus 4% reading. So this is GDP in the US, their, their growth rate over the period of the last 12 readings. And as you can see, we've kind of hovered around 2%. Uh, and in fact, Trump, you could say, had done a pretty good job at keeping this number um, fairly consistent. I mean, there were periods where, you know, we were... You know, we saw the inversion of the yield curve and we thought the trade war wasn't going to play out. There were fears that this was going to get quite low several months ago, but it somewhat stabilized until obviously the pandemic has hit. And what we're expecting today is a median consensus of minus 4%. Now, minus 4%, I'm going to have to put this onto a 25-year chart of US GDP to capture then the global financial crisis. So you can see here during the severity of that fallout, the GDP level got down to around the minus eight, minus nine percent type level. And today a minus four percent would be here. However, the bottom end of the range, if you look on the calendar, is minus 15 percent to a high, most optimistic, a plus one percent. So minus 15 percent would be by far the worst there on record. Um, so why is there, you know, when you're looking at the distribution of these estimates from these banks, obviously the, the models that they run to try and generate these economic predictions about this type of data, you know, given the fact that we capture the last two weeks of March within this first quarter reading, it's incredibly difficult then to get a degree of real concrete evidence uh, or calculation into that model. And hence the variance is very wide because the, the lockdown would have been hard to just get good quality information uh, given this, the, the, the time frame. So here, what I'd say is, yes, it's expected at minus 4%. Could it come in much lower than that? Sure, it could. So the point is there is how important is that beyond the initial knee-jerk reaction? I'm not so sure because ultimately, don't forget, people are more obsessed about Q2, not Q1. Q2 is what's going to be the shocker uh, when GDP is going to, you know, put put whatever today's number comes out as well in the shadows, uh, because that's going to really capture the severity of the total national lockdown in America uh, and this mass layoff situation that we've seen unfold in the jobless numbers. So yeah, I definitely would be would be out of any positions. Definitely would be uh, listening out for that figure. We're more than likely going to see an initial knee-jerk reaction to it. Um, but don't forget as well, traders will be mindful that you got the Fed later. So if there is any trade opportunities, they could well be fairly short-lived as people will be wanting to just clear the deck just in case we do hear of any surprises. No point going in in any position of risk into the Fed as much as we're kind of suggesting that it could be a fairly tame event uh, with all things being equal. From an earnings perspective, um, this is a bit small um, for the Amplify guys. I've sent this out to all of you this morning, so you'll have the full list and you can see all the corresponding numbers, what you're looking out for. Um, the pre-market names I'm particularly interested in uh, going in chronological order. Um, General Electric will be around 11.30 London time. Um, I'm also keeping a close eye on Boeing. Boeing actually you know, was one of the biggest companies in the Dow not that long ago. It's now the 10th largest company in the Dow. So yeah, quite a radical shift, obviously, for that firm. Their market cap's only actually around 78 billion now. So way smaller um, than what it was only around two years ago. Um, to put it in context, I think Netflix has now got a market cap of more than double that size, uh, nearly triple. So uh, yeah, what a world we live in. Um, aftermarket, of course, as I mentioned, there's quite a few other key names to look out for, namely Microsoft and Facebook. They're probably the biggest names to be aware of, but you also have the likes of Qualcomm uh, as well as eBay and Tesla. Uh, it's another interesting name that's going to be reporting as well in the aftermarket trade. So uh, remember, just follow me on Twitter. Um, I'll be tweeting some of those results as they come out uh, later on this evening for those interested. 
Um, all right, that is it. I uh, wish you a good day. Don't forget to uh, register for the event and hopefully I'll speak to you later on this evening. All right, have a great day ahead. Thanks very much.